Chapter 61 Three Witnesses The year was 1952. Mita Branham knocked again. Bill, are you all right? Yes, he answered. Come in. Mita stepped into the bedroom holding her sleeping baby. Bill, has something happened? A few hours ago I had to get up with Sarah, so while I was up I thought I would check on you. But when I came to this door, I had the strongest feeling that I shouldn't open it. I wondered if maybe there was a vision going on, so I sat in the living room and rocked Sarah until just now. Bill looked at the time. It was six o'clock. The vision had held him for over three hours. Yes, honey, it was a vision. The angel of the Lord has been here ever since three o'clock this morning. God has forgiven me, and I'm going to get over these parasites. Oh, Bill, she gasped, that's wonderful news. A few minutes later, her excitement softened into a question. Bill, could you see that neurotic woman from New Albany today? She has begged me to call her the next time the anointing comes on you. Sure, honey, tell her to come over around ten o'clock. First thing this morning, I need to go to the bank and see about those check stubs for our income tax records. I'm also going to call Dr. Lucas and see if he can give me another examination. While Mita went to phone Mrs. Shane, Bill sat down to think about what the vision meant. The first scripture was easy because it paralleled his misadventures in South Africa. Paul told those sailors if they would have listened to him and stayed in Crete for the winter, they would not have lost their ship. Evidently, Paul also had trouble with people who didn't believe he was led by God. Paul suffered along with his crew for that mistake, but by God's grace no lives were lost. For Bill, the lesson was obvious. Never again would he follow men's ideas when the Lord was leading down another path. Understanding how Joshua chapter 1 applied to him was more challenging. As I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Surely this was a declaration of God's commitment to his ministry. But what was the specific connection between his ministry and Joshua's? Was God commissioning him to lead the church into a spiritual promised land the same way Joshua led Israel into a natural promised land? That's how it sounded. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Not only did Joshua lead the children of Israel in their fight to possess Canaan, after the battles were over, Joshua divided the land among the twelve tribes, directing them to their earthly inheritance. According to the Apostle Paul, God promised the Christian church a spiritual inheritance. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Bill wondered if he was being called to lead the Gentile church into her spiritual inheritance. Whatever else the vision meant, it was apparent that many battles lay ahead. God was encouraging him to go forward boldly. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Picking up his pen, Bill wrote a brief account of the vision on the back flyleaf of his Schofield Reference Bible, so that he would always remember it and always have it with him. During breakfast, Bill's mother-in-law stopped by to ask, Is everything here all right? This morning I went to the sink to wash last night's dishes, and I felt the Lord was saying to me, Go over to Bill's house. Something has happened. After Bill told Mrs. Broy about the angel's repeated visits earlier that morning, Bill remembered something the Bible said, At the mouth of two witnesses, or at the mouth of three witnesses, shall the matter be established. Here was his second witness, confirming what the angel told him was true. When breakfast was over, Bill called Dr. Lucas. I'd like to get an examination this morning. 
what for? I haven't got those amoebas anymore. Yes, you've got them. Once a person gets those little devils, he has them the rest of his life. This morning the Lord Jesus did something for me. I'd like you to check me over one more time. Dr. Lucas hesitated. Um, well, I just examined you the other day. Your intestines are loaded with those parasites. But if you want to be examined again, come over this afternoon and I'll take another look. Bill got to the bank just as it was opening. His business did not take long. On his way out the door, he suddenly felt like he shouldn't leave. Stepping over to the side of the lobby, he prayed quietly, Lord God, what would you have me to do? He stood there for a minute holding his briefcase under his arm. Then a voice sounded in his head, Look at Bob Dennison. Bob Dennison, one of the bank tellers, was a longtime acquaintance of his. Bob was standing behind one of the teller windows with his head down. Bill walked over and said brightly, Good morning, Bobby. How is everything today? When Bob lifted his head, tears glazed his eyes. Billy, I don't know how you're going to take this, but this morning at three o'clock I woke up and I had dreamed that I should tell you about my problem. Now here you are, so I hope you won't mind. No, Bobby, go right ahead. Almost all of my people died of cancer, and now I have every symptom of it. I have been worried to death for the last few days. Taking Bob's right hand in his own left, Bill felt the pounding vibrations of a cancerous demon. Bill's left hand swelled as it turned red. Bobby, let's pray that Jesus Christ will touch your body. After a short prayer, the vibration stopped. The cancer was gone. Bill thought, Here is my third witness. By the time he got back home, Mrs. Shane had already arrived. Since she was too nervous to drive herself, two of her friends had brought her. Bill asked them to wait in the living room while he talked with Mrs. Shane in the den. A Baptist man had also come to the house wanting prayer. Bill had never met him before, but he knew him by reputation because this man used to play professional baseball for Louisville, Kentucky. Now he was dying with cancer of the spleen, a condition for which medical science had no cure. Bill asked him to wait in a bedroom. Entering his study, Bill found Mrs. Shane pacing the floor, wringing her hands. He sat on a stool. Howdy, Mrs. Shane. Please be seated. Flinging herself down in a chair, she stuttered, Br Brother Branham, is the angel of the Lord here? Yes, sister, we're sitting in his presence. Good. Now you can cast this evil spirit out of me. I feel like any minute the ground might split open and swallow me. Just a minute, sister. We have to watch what we're casting out. Let's talk a while first. He wanted to get her mind away from the issue so she would calm down. Let's you and I take a little trip. No, she screeched. I can't take a trip. Her voice climbed hysterically. Relax, Bill soothed. I was speaking about a mental trip. Let's go back to when God made man and woman and put them in the Garden of Eden. He talked softly, soothing her nerves. Soon Bill saw a little black car speeding through the air between them. He asked, Were you ever in an accident? No, Brother Branham. Why do you ask? Oh, I saw something. He kept talking. Soon the vision returned, unfolding the ugly truth. You got married during the last war, and your husband was shipped over to France. You got lonely and started running around with other men. One night you were out in a black car with a blonde boy, and you broke your marriage vow. On the way back, that black car was almost struck by a train as it crossed the railroad tracks. Mrs. Shane screamed and collapsed on the floor. Mita dashed into the room to see what was wrong. Together, Bill and Mita helped the woman get back onto the chair. She shook uncontrollably and sobbed. Brother Branham, don't you dare tell that to anyone. Sister, right there lays your trouble. You are never going to get better until you make it right. I don't care how many times they pray for you. They could stomp and scream and anoint you with 50 gallons of oil, and it wouldn't do any good. As long as you have unconfessed sin in your life, that devil has a right to stay there. If you want to get well, you're going to have to confess that sin to your husband and make it right. 
I have confessed it, Brother Branham. I confessed it to God a long time ago. It wasn't God you sinned against. You were a married woman. You sinned against your marriage vows. Brother Branham, I can't tell my husband. He'd leave me for sure. Sister, you know I've told the truth. Nobody knows that sin except you, that blonde boy, and God. You told me you've been seeing a psychiatrist for ten years. He couldn't drag that out of you. But that is your trouble. It's laying way down deep in your subconscious mind. You're never going to get well until you tell your husband about it and clean up your conscience. I can't do it, she sobbed. I've got three children. It would break up our home. Your home might break up anyhow, because mentally you're not going to hold together much longer. You'd better get your husband and talk it over. I, I can't, she bawled. I just can't do it. Bill stood up. That's up to you, sister. I've done all I can do. I've told you what God showed me, and you know it's the truth. The rest is up to you. I have to go now and see a man in the other room who has cancer. She pleaded, Oh, Brother Branham, don't leave me. Suddenly, Bill saw a man standing beside Mrs. Shane. He was tall with neatly combed black hair, and he was wearing a white jacket, which he turned so that Bill could read the word Chevrolet printed across the back. Bill said, Doesn't your husband work for the Chevrolet company? Yes, she whimpered. He's a tall man with dark wavy hair that he combs to the side. Yes, that's right. He's got the same sin to confess to you. Her hands flew up to her cheeks. No, not my husband. He's a church deacon. I don't care what he shows on the outside. God sees his heart. During the war when your husband landed in England, he took a girl and lived with her. But that's not all. Just three days ago, he snuck off with a black-headed woman who works in his office. She was wearing a pink dress. They parked under a beech tree in a green Chevrolet bearing an Indiana license plate. And right there, he lived as untrue to you as you once did to him. I know the woman, she gasped, and I know that car, too. You'd better go call your husband and talk this thing over. While Bill went to pray for the man with cancer, Mrs. Shane called her husband at work and asked him to meet her on the road. Her two friends drove her to the spot and waited until her husband drove up. When she got in the front seat with her husband, she said slowly, I know I've kept you broke these last ten years going every week to that psychiatrist, but now I think I've gotten to the bottom of my problem. I did something once, something bad, something that has haunted me ever since. I have to tell you what it is, and I hope you'll forgive me. When she finished confessing her sin, her husband started to act indignant. And she added, Three days ago, weren't you with the secretary from your office? Didn't the two of you park a green Chevrolet under a beech tree and do the same thing I did? He eyed her warily. Who have you been talking to? I was just up to see Brother Branham. He told me. At this revelation... His hypocrisy deflated like a punctured tire. Honey, that is the truth. If you'll forgive me, I'll forgive you. I'll go down to the church and resign as a deacon, and you resign as a Sunday school teacher. Let's get right with God and raise our children right. Driving back to the Branham house, they walked up to the door with their arms around each other. Bill had just finished praying with the cancer patient. The man had received his miracle. Bill said to the Shanes, I'm glad to see you got this thing worked out between you. Now we can call in the name of Jesus and make that devil move out. A few minutes later, Mrs. Shane was a new woman. Later that afternoon, Bill showed up at the clinic. As busy as Dr. Lucas was, he still squeezed Bill into his schedule. Now what were you saying on the phone this morning? I don't have those amoebas anymore. Reverend Branham, You're probably just experiencing a temporary relief from the symptoms. That sometimes happens. Medically, we call it remission. No, Doc, this is not temporary. This is permanent. I'm absolutely healed. Did you bring me a stool sample? Dr. Lucas took the sample over to the clinic's laboratory. Soon he came back and said, I'd like to check you further. When he finished this examination, he said, 
Reverend Branham, the amoebas are still there, but they are no longer active. I've never heard of this happening before, and I don't have any idea what would cause them to go dormant. I do, said Bill confidently. The Lord Jesus healed me this morning about three o'clock. The doctor said, I'll have to examine you regularly for three months before I can say you're not infectious anymore. You can examine me every day if you want to. As Bill was leaving through the waiting room, he saw Dr. Lucas's partner standing in the doorway of his office, talking with a nurse. Mr. Branham said the doctor, walking over to shake his hand, It's good to see you again. In his mind, Bill prayed, Lord, if you want me to talk to him about religion, let him bring the subject up. I don't want to push it on him. The doctor said, What do you think about those tribes in Africa? Aren't they getting more progressive all the time? Yes, I suppose they are. There's a lot of East Indians transplanted to South Africa, aren't there? That's right. The population of Durban is almost half Indians. I've read a lot about that. Hindus, aren't they? Many of them are Hindus, but some are Muslims. A smart bunch of people, those Indians. In fact, I think Mahatma Gandhi is the smartest man who ever lived. Every man has the right to his own opinion, but I differ with you there. I think it was Jesus Christ. I'll bet you didn't have much success getting those Hindus and Muslims to switch over to your religion, did you? Oh, yes. We had about 30,000 converts in just one day. What? the doctor blurted, dropping his cigarette on the floor. 30,000 converts in one day? If you question it, you can call Sidney Smith, mayor of Durban, and ask him. You'll find out that we probably made a low estimate. Are you sure they were Hindus? Many of them were Hindus. When they saw the power of Almighty God moving in their midst, they believed it was the Lord Jesus, just like I told them it was. I watched hundreds of Hindu women wiping off the red dot from their foreheads when they accepted Christ. Everyone in the waiting room seemed to be listening to this conversation. The doctor twisted his shoe over the burning cigarette he had dropped. Then he patted Bill on the back and said, Boy, you must be a genius. No, sir, I'm a seventh grade dropout. My Lord Jesus is the genius. Oh, I don't know, said the doctor. That's going a little too far out in the limb for me. Excuse me for talking so straight with you, doctor, but you're missing something. You're a smart man, full of knowledge. But knowledge can only take you so far. There were two trees in the Garden of Eden. One of them was the tree of knowledge, and the other was the tree of life. When Adam left the tree of life to eat fruit off the tree of knowledge, he separated himself from his maker. Ever since then, man has been eating off that tree of knowledge, and it's destroying him. He learned how to make metal, and what did he create? Swords and arrows. Then he discovered gunpowder. After a while, he invented the automobile. That has killed more people than gunpowder. Now he's got himself an atom bomb. But if man hadn't invented any of that, he'd still die. No, not if he had stayed with the tree of life. He would have lived forever. Death came because he left the tree of life for the tree of knowledge. But man can still live forever if he comes back to the tree of life, which is Jesus Christ. I don't know about that, the doctor muttered. I'm not against education, Bill finished. But the problem you smart fellows have with your education is you try to reason everything out. You climb up the tree of knowledge as high as you can go. But when you get so high and can't get any higher, you reject everything you can't understand. The tree of knowledge is all right. But when you get as high as you can on that tree, you should jump over to the tree of life and keep right on climbing. That's what faith in God's word is all about.